morning to our press webinar about the results of our ESME impact assessment for COVID-19. We want to share the results and also the actions we, we um, worked out out of the results. And uh, we start directly with our president, Ivan Stefanitz, who will hold the general introduction. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Horst, and good morning, everybody. I'd like to thank, uh, first of all, uh, Bernil Weiss, who initiated this survey, and also all the colleagues who participated. I think this survey showed that uh, SMEs have been really heavily affected. Uh, actually, this survey we activated from the end of March uh, until the end of April, and uh, over 900 SMEs participated from uh, 13 countries. Uh, the results showed that 90% uh, of uh, SMEs have been um, affected, what we expected, and particularly the issue is uh, the access to credit and uh, the liquidity issue, of course. 25% uh, of SMEs, they are saying they uh, have to basically fire employees and 25% also uh, showed uh, the troubles that they have uh, they had to cut some um, employment contracts uh, heavily. Uh, only 11% of SMEs, uh, they expressed uh, the will to continue more than one year, which is quite frightening result. And uh, altogether, uh, we see that 71% of SMEs, uh, they need, uh, first of all, financial help. So uh, the result shows that uh, SMEs are in really, really very difficult situation across the Europe. And um, first of all, liquidity is the issue. Secondly, it is the issue of uh, taxes and administrative rules. And the last but not least, uh, they proposed more flexibility on the uh, labor market. So basically everything what we are doing uh, we can see that uh, we just uh, have to stress out our activities. And um, the result uh, showed the need for immediate action. I have to say that SME Europe uh, is very active, not only in terms of organization of web webinars, but I'm happy to say that uh, immediately at the beginning of crisis, we asked the European Commission, particularly Madam President Ursula von der Leyen, that uh, SMEs should be included in the first financial aid, and it was the case. Now I think it is the challenge that this aid will come through national governments uh, directly uh, to the SMEs, to the people who need help, and uh, we will focus on that in uh, next our activities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Stefanitz. And now we're coming to Mr. Waban, who will give us a perspective from Sweden, because everybody expecting that it's a special situation. What is your results and impressions? Please, Mr. Jürgen Waban, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Horst, and it is correct. The result from Sweden is uh, a bit different from the general results. And this, of course, um, has to do with the strategy from the from, the, from Sweden uh, to combat COVID-19. Uh, since the strategy, it, it is a bit different. We, we do not have total lockdown in Sweden and therefore we have seen that it, uh, it, the results has been slightly better uh, for the SMEs in Sweden. Nevertheless, it is in a very alarming situation and most of the SMEs are in a very distressed situation. Um, as you know, shops and restaurants and hotels and businesses in general, they are open, uh, but consumer behavior has changed dramatically. Um, from the Swedish result, we can see that 80% says that their uh, businesses have, have been affected negatively. We can see that uh, a quarter of the businesses says that their turnover on an annual basis will decrease by 50% or more. And uh, one of the most alarming uh, uh, findings of this issue, of this survey, is that 50% of all the SMEs says that they do not have liquidity for two months, 50%. 
meaning that uh, half of the restaurants, half of the hair cutters, half of the uh, hotels, half of the show shops, everything, half of them will be closed in, in June. So uh, uh, while this strategy from all of the European countries to combat COVID-19 has been to flatten the curve, and I'm sure this is a correct strategy out of a health issue, this is a very dramatic uh, thing for SMEs since it prolongs the, uh, the crisis for the small and medium-sized enterprises. And now, of course, uh, governments all over Europe has to do it utmost to save those businesses in order to save jobs. Um, and that is, main, 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 that is the main issue here. There has to be more, more uh, action from governments and from uh, the European institutions. Thank you, Horst. Thank you very much, Jürgen. Uh, financial aid, I think, is in the focus. It's necessary. And we have already measures uh, in the, uh, mentioned. But now, Mrs. Uh, Isabel Benyomea, what we want to concrete that member states in the European Union is doing to this financial aid for SMEs. Please. Unmuting? Yeah. <laughs> so. Thank you, thank you so much, Horst, and, and congratulations on on this great this great survey, which I think it's it's a very useful and it came in in a very important moment for for SMEs all around Europe. I I I, I, I listened to the Swedish uh, case and then I listen, I think of the Spanish case where we had a terrible lockdown for two months and, and we will see, but the, the effects on the SMEs are going to be ter ter terrific and the, the situation will have a huge impact in, in, in employment, which I think is the biggest, the biggest problem that Europe will be facing in the next, in the next three years. So we do need SMEs in order to continue creating jobs in Europe. We need SMEs in order to be able to to continue creating growth in Europe. And unless they have access to finance, unless they are able to survive during this lockdown and they have enough resources to start again whenever it's possible, that won't be possible. So we really need to focus on how to make it possible for the SMEs, for the self-employment, to have enough finance to survive and then to start it over again. Um, in the survey, there were uh, many, many answers, but there were two options that were clearly reflect. One was uh, regarding the possibility of offering grants, government grants, and the other one is helping to have access to credit on the, on the financial institutions and see how to guarantee those credits. So we need to enforce measures at the European level, but also at, uh, the member states have to do the same in order to be able to make it easier, make it accessible, the finance for SMEs. But there's a, a big question that is also on the table and we need to bear that in mind is that many SMEs weren't in the best uh, economical situation before the crisis and perhaps they, were not, they are not in shape to survive. So the big question is to identify those SMEs which have the, the characteristics, the circumstances that will allow them to survive and to be able to continue after this lockdown. So the first outcome would be how important is access to finance? Because we need to bear in mind that only, only if the SMEs have access to finance, they're able to maintain the jobs and they will be able to create new jobs. And I do uh, uh, focus very much on the idea of jobs because we, we know that after this huge uh, health crisis, there will come a social crisis and the best social policy is creating jobs. So we do need them. So we need to make sure that we, from the European perspective, develop the right tools to access finance for SMEs, but we need to put also pressure on the member states in order to guarantee there's both the idea of grants and the idea of how to guarantee the credits from the financial institutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we're coming to Julio Winkler. Financial aid is not the only tool. It's also about tax and grants. Please, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Host. Good morning to everybody. First of all, let me congratulate SME Europe of the EPP for this uh, great work and our colleague Pernil Weiss for initiating uh, the survey. 
then uh, let me say a word of thank you to all the SMEs who responded to our, uh, to our uh, survey, more than 900 SMEs, that's a very important uh, figure. Also, a special thanks for SMEs in my uh, circum uh, uh, constituency, uh, of course, Transylvania in uh, Romania. Then, uh, uh, of course, we need uh, support measures and just to continue the line of them, uh, support has to come from European Union level, but also support has to come from governments. And uh, as we see very clearly, situation is different in various member states. Also, the fiscal capacity is different in the member states and also the possibility of governments of granting uh, uh, aid is, uh, is different. This is when, where the European Union comes in and this is where our recovery plan, which we discussed last week in the European Parliament also, will play a very important role. Now uh, about uh, governments. Uh, I think that uh, one of the ways which uh, have been mentioned by many SMEs uh, is uh, having tax cuts or having tax deferrals. Because of course that the the burden that, uh, that is on the SMEs comes partly from uh, taxation. And uh, 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 as, as it was just said by, by our colleague Isabel, jobs is a very important uh, aspect. Uh, safeguarding the jobs and the capacity in the second half of the year of creating new jobs instead of the jobs that have been lost. So, uh, so uh, uh, tax cuts uh, could be good policies. Uh, it depends uh, on, uh, on uh, each member state and, uh, of course, it uh, should not, at European Union level, should not uh, create a competition because we need our, uh, our internal market to be, to be as, uh, as uh, um, functional as possible. And then uh, uh, another issue about funding, about uh, all the SMEs asked uh, have responded that they are in problems with liquidity. So, uh, so uh, uh, funding is very important, but it's not, uh, uh, it's not uh, uh, in any way possible. We need simplification. And this is, uh, first of all, in the hands of, uh, of uh, member state authorities, of uh, banking institutions, of administrative authorities, because the, uh, the mechanisms to grant fundings have to be simplified. The signal was correct at the European Union level because the European Commission introduced among the first measures the flexibility. So now flexibility has to be rightly used, but in, uh, uh, in a manner that does not uh, uh, defer uh, uh, supplementary burden on SMEs. We need simple, clear procedures and fast tracking of those procedures. Back to you, Horst. Thank you, Mr. Winkler. And uh, we ca this is not the last tool we have here in, in this um, financial aspect. Investments. Mr. Stefanitz, what we can say about this? What should be the targets? How to settle investment here in Europe in a good way? Please. Unmuting. Yes, sir. It's absolutely a very good point. And I can only reconfirm all the points which were made by my colleagues. Simplification of administration tax cut and liquidity. This is the crucial. We should not forget it. And this is our ongoing work. But uh, after this uh, crisis situation, we have to think about future. And then if we think about future, we have to think about investments. I think the major tool for next uh, investment package will be multi-annual financial framework. We are discussing this issue at the European Parliament. Uh, the European Parliament uh, is proposing to double um, basically European budget uh, for next seven years from 2021 until 2027. Now we know it will be a big discussion between uh, Parliament, Commission and Member States because we propose major shift and uh, this should be a so-called uh, Marshall Plan for Europe. This uh, should be really major investment package where SMEs should play a crucial role. If we talk about digital agenda, if we talk about Green Deal, all the aspects um, uh, must include uh, the access to new investment capital for SMEs uh, because, uh, as we know, they play a major role in job creation. So. 
we should not forget about EU Invest and all the packages, but from my point of view, multi-annual financial framework will be the most important package and most important tool for next development of SMEs. Thank you. Thank you. And we're coming to the second large package of, of SMEUs, uh, SME Europe advices or action plan, useful administrative reforms and legal processes. Mr. Winkler, what is the key of, of, of this uh, package? Uh, our uh, survey and also the webinars and debates and discussions organized in the last two months by um, SME Europe only come to confirm something that is a, an evergreen principle, I would say. Uh, it is uh, about reduction of uh, bureaucracy. Uh, reduction of red tape, reduction of bureaucratic hurdles towards companies. This is really an evergreen, but is uh, uh, so much more important now in the times of crisis. Uh, we have lockdown, we have the social distancing rules, we have all the uh, or majority of administrative uh, offices and institutions which are working online. We have a huge number of administrative obligations which simply can be postponed or maybe can be rethinked. We have this huge possibility now to, to uh, introduce digitization and to help uh, companies uh, reduce their bureaucratic hurdle. And uh, uh, if you would pose the question to an SME, maybe what you prefer, a certain amount of uh, funding or a certain amount of reduction of your burden, reduction of your duties, reduction of your uh, uh, annoying obligations, then I'm sure that many of the SMEs would prefer, please make my life easier, please make my life simpler, and let me do my business and uh, not uh, uh, bother to, to do uh, often quite useless bureaucracy. So this is an evergreen, but is much more important now in times of crisis and in, uh, in uh, our preparation to start recovery, reduce bureaucracy reduce red tape, gold plating, and all the associated hurdles towards SMEs. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's also the cheapest actions and it's in our own hands. And uh, I think we're coming to another question. So what can administ administrative reforms do again, uh, for the labor market against unemployment? Ms. Benjamea, um, what it means for the labor market if we do reforms? Yes, uh, thank you. Following what Mr. Winkle was just saying, um, if you ask uh, any businessman or woman in the European level, they were asked, first of all, to have uh, access to liquidity, then to have a, a, simply, a very simple way of doing things and get rid of bureaucracy. But on the, on the third, they would say, we need to have a very flexible labor market. In, in, three different, in, three, in three different areas. First of all, the cost of hiring people. We need to reduce the cost of hiring people. Then we need to have a fle flexible market because if you make it very complicated to hire and very expensive to hire, especially during the crisis, who would dare to get in, in, this, in this process of hiring new people whenever it's a burden, a huge burden? So we need to make it cheaper. We need to make it flexible. And of course, the third one, we need to really, uh, from the European perspective, create the single market so that we can have people moving from one member state to another. And for that, we need to have the recognitions, the recognition of qualification among the European Union. And that's something that the SMEs are also requesting. So having a very flexible labor market is the best way to create more employment. And we need to get rid of the idea that having a very rigid labor market protects employment. It's absolutely the, absolutely the other way. And we really need to do both from the European perspective, but this is the duty of the member states is their obligation to uh, make a flexible uh, a labor market, taking into account that right now, most of the employers are thinking on how to reduce their uh, employment sheet in, and we need to get them thinking on how to hire new people in a few months. So flexibility, reducing the cost and recognition of qualifications. Thank you, Horst. Thank you very much. I think this is really the time for reforms in a good way. Every crisis has also chances, but you mentioned already the European internal market. 
And here we're coming to Jürgen Warborn, the internal market of, of Europe. Is this now time to fulfill his destiny? Mr. The floor is yours. Yes, I think we should uh, come back to business as usual as soon as possible. Um, unfortunately, the internal, uh, the internal market has been hurt in this process and um, we haven't been able to keep the single market open uh, like we should during a crisis. The, one of the most uh, distressing situation about this is the personal uh, protective equipment that was uh, hindered of, of exporting from some e European countries to other countries. Um, this, of course, this is not the European solidarity that we would like to have when we, uh, when we restrict exports. The, 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 the single market is the heart of the European idea that uh, both uh, uh, products, services, people, money should be able to flow over borders. Then, um, so we have to come back to this as soon as possible. And unfortunately, there are still, um, depending on how you count, seven, 10 or 11 countries that have export, uh, export restrictive measures still within the European market. So those has to be taken away. And I think the commission has work to do here to make sure that all the member states um, uh, act according to our common rules. Then the other part of this is, of course, the, the world trade, because as we have seen that the internal market does not work perfectly during the crisis, this is the case with world trade as well. Uh, this was a, a problem before the corona crisis, but it has been uh, accelerated during the crisis. Um, I think it is very important to go back to the multilateral rules-based trading system that, uh, that has given so many benefits, not least for Europe and the member states and the citizens of Europe. One thing that I am a bit afraid of now is that we are talking about uh, um, only buying European goods and being protective, uh, protectionists uh, and so on. I think that is uh, totally the wrong way to go uh, for Europe as a whole, for citizens of Europe and for businesses of Europe. We have to have this open free trade thinking when it comes to businesses. One thing and the last thing I'd like to mention here is the discussion on the di diversification of supply chains. I can understand that and I think that it is probably wise for some businesses to rethink how they source their, their goods. But I do not think that this should be a process driven by politicians. This is something that the market should act on their own. And if politicians hinder businesses from sourcing from different countries, I think that would be totally the wrong way to go. One thing we should do, as my very last thing, is to make sure that we have more free trade uh, agreements so that, um, so that we um, give the possibilities for, people, for businesses to source their, uh, their products from, from different parts of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jürgen. I think it's very important that we're going not in the wrong way because it will have a domino effect and we have a lockdown of, of the economy worldwide. I think it's a crucial moment and I think good that you are fighting for, for this open markets in the benefits of SMEs. And we're coming now to the last part uh, of our, uh, of our um, uh, packages, investment in infrastructure, in uh, education and research. Mr. Winkler, Julio, uh, you were already also fighting for Erasmus, Erasmus Plus already. You write, wrote a letter to the commission. What are here our positions? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, I think if uh, there is something sensational that happened in the last two months, then I think uh, digitization is the topic. Digitization is the issue. It's a huge leap forward that happened in the last uh, 60 days uh, in our uh, uh, professional life, in our social life, in our education uh, styles. Uh, home office has changed, 
e-learning, which uh, 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 where was a topic of huge debate uh, six months ago, or the, the whole conference call system and the, the way of making business. So uh, what we need now is to be sure that everybody has the right digital skills. So everybody should receive the right digital education. Uh, either we are speaking about youngsters who uh, seemingly have those skills in a natural way, but of course they have to learn. But also we have to think about uh, all the uh, uh, demographies. So I think lifelong learning will be rethinked uh, uh, and we need the skills, the, the digital skills for entrepreneurs, for uh, people in rural areas, people who want to become entrepreneurs, uh, or uh, uh, people who want to participate in business life. Then, uh, of course, uh, how to do it. And I think here the idea of the public-private partnership is very, very important. Of course, governments have their role. National budget has its role to have digital infrastructure. We could see now in the last two months that, uh, that uh, uh, broadband is not a given, that the digital connectivity is not uh, uh, equal in all European regions. We have better and, and, and not so good uh, situation in many regions. Of course, uh, 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 when we speak about digital transformation, we have to speak about the role of European Union. And you have mentioned Erasmus, but also the EU and the European Commission through the cohesion funds has a huge role in building up and bettering the, the digital infrastructure, the connectivity. It's all about connectivity. So finally, it's about the internal market. We need a digital internal market truly uh, functioning in the European Union. And uh, finally, let me just make outside the, outside the survey, but inside this issue of digitization, let me just make a personal comment. I think that also the last 60 days have learned us that technology is very important, but technology cannot replace certain things. And I think that technology helps us doing business, helps us uh, uh, learn, helps us making politics, but cannot replace the uh, human interaction. We see also after 60 days uh, very frightening forms of alienation. We see also that, that, that direct human interaction cannot be, cannot be replaced. So huge accent on digitization, huge hopes in, 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 in digital connectivity and in technology in general, but still keep in mind that also learning, also business, the handshake will not be replaced ever. And, uh, and the direct human interaction will not be uh, replaced because it's the basis of trust and you cannot make business outside trust. But thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think this is a good closing of, of this press conference webinar because yes, humans are living from interaction as social beings and business is living from trust and trust is from personal contact. I think this is a good thing. and. Uh, I want only to mention once again Ms. Pernille Weiss, who will add her comments uh, later to this video. But uh, for her, it was very important also to mention that uh, green investment, green technology and innovation can be also a chance. We should not forget this, that there is a, a chance that we also have to get new markets. It is necessary to, to fight the climate change, not to forget during the crisis, but in an intelligent way. And I think this is the smart way we as in Europe wants to go in, in this during this crisis, smart not to violent SMEs, but to give them new chances. And I think to summarize it now uh, short, we thinking that the market is, is working, he's healthy in himself, he is healing. We believe in entrepreneurship and we want to help for a restart, but only in so necessary as, as needed because freedom is the best medicine for entrepreneurs. And I give now the closing word to Mr. Ivan Stefanitz. Uh, thank you, Horton. Thank you, all my dear colleagues, for participation. Uh, yeah, maybe just last points because many great points have been raised uh, by all of you. But last point is that really I'd like to stress out the importance of uh, single market, as Jurgen has mentioned already, because single market is hurted and 
many company, many countries they preferred protest protectionistic uh, rules and basically they closed the borders. Now it's important to come back to the functioning single market. It's important to coordinate borders opening uh, in the European Union. That's the call also as uh, SM Europe, we have asked European Commission to do that. And I do believe as uh, soon as possible, we'll come back to the functioning single market and we will use all, all the opportunities. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, survey. Thank you very much for this uh, webinar. And I looking forward to work uh, with you also uh, in order to improve the situation of our SMEs. Thank you. And don't forget to follow us on our website, on the social media, and follow our members who are active for you, for our SMEs in Europe. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you.